Hello. So yes, I'm a developer working at Microsoft, and I'm part of the front-end team building Yammer. This is the front-end team. We've got seven engineers in London, 12 in San Francisco, and one in Redmond. And this talk will go through some of the pains we've suffered while scaling our team and our code base. And the goal of the talk is to help you avoid some of the mistakes we've made and hopefully to start a discussion on other problems and solutions that you may have found. Uh, the slides for this talk, along with my speaker notes, are available here in my GitHub account. Okay, let's start. First, a quick introduction on what Yammer is and how we work, just to give some context. So Yammer is an enterprise social network, which just means that it's a communication tool where conversations are public by default inside your network. So you join groups, which get shown on the left. You have threaded conversations inside those groups, which get shown in the center. And then you work with files, and you follow people, and you get recommendations, and that kind of thing. Yammer started out in San Francisco in 2008. The engineering team in London started in 2012, just before the Microsoft acquisition. And the team in Redmond started in 2013. We have around 220 engineers across the three offices. In San Francisco, we have something like 150 engineers. In London, around 40. And in Redmond, around 30. We have a web client and native iPhone, iPad, Android, and Windows Phone clients. But most users are accessing Yammer through the web app. And I just run this tool on the front end side of things, and it tells us that we have 180,000 lines of JavaScript code and 145,000 lines of CSS, which seemed a bit shocking to me, but OK. So how do we work? The way we develop the product is by delivering the features in a roadmap in small increments and by performing A-B tests on them to measure their effect. And if you want to read more about our product development methodology, you can learn more at that URL. We have many small cross-functional teams working on product or engineering-focused projects. And once a project is finished, uh, the team on that project disbands and they join other projects. So we're constantly moving and working with different people. We deploy twice a day, once from London and once from San Francisco. And we don't wait until a feature is done to ship it to production. What we do is we hide things behind feature flags. And we can define a new feature flag by creating a YAML file like the one you're seeing on the left where we describe the name of the feature flag and the treatment groups uh, it consists of. In this case, it's just a disabled group and an enabled group. So then in our Ruby or JavaScript code, we check which treatment group the current user is in, and we show or hide features based on that. So we use feature flags both for rolling out changes incrementally. So maybe we push a feature just for Yammer users and then to all of Microsoft, and then to real users. And we also use feature flags for A-B testing. And when A-B testing, what we do is we randomly assign a user to one treatment group or the other, and then we measure each group to see how the feature affected our metrics. So to recap, we are distributed across three offices. We are all building the same product, even though we have multiple clients and each has their own code base, but we are all building the same thing. And both the code bases and the teams are in constant change. OK, so now on to the meat of the talk. How does this way of working affect our team, and how do we try to scale, scale it up? First, I will talk about the team, and then I will talk about the code base. So the team. As I said, we have many projects going on at any point in time, and we try to avoid having two projects working on the same area of the code base at the same time in order to avoid coordination costs. But sometimes it's inevitable. And when Yammer was just the San Francisco office, most communication happened face to face. So if two teams needed to coordinate, they just got together in a room and they discussed whatever they needed. 
but this changed drastically in 2012 when the engineering team in London started because we started seeing problems like London wasn't up to date on what San Francisco was doing and vice versa and people were stepping on each other's toes and there was a general feeling of disconnect between the two offices and I don't think there was anything wrong with us particularly it's just that we had become a distributed team and we had to learn to work as such so what we did is we went from face-to-face -face discussions and meetings to posting everything on Yammer. And face-to-face -face is still useful because you can transmit much more information than in a digital medium. But even when we have a face-to-face -face meeting, afterwards we try to post a summary on Yammer so that people who were not present can still follow and participate. Another benefit is that things can happen asynchronously because we don't need to interrupt other people's flow. We just post on Yammer and then the other person can deal with it whenever they have the time. And one final benefit is that every conversation is searchable and has a URL that you can reference in other posts or in documents, which makes it much, much easier to trace back decisions that, that people made in the past. The other big issue we encountered when we became a distributed team was sharing technical knowledge. Because when SF was the only office, uh, people discussed things like code quality and best practices in person. And even though all of our repos were on GitHub, we weren't making use of pull requests because for some reason we thought that code review was a burdensome process that would slow us down. So after the engineering team in London started, we continued working like that for about a year, but it just wasn't working for us. It wasn't working for us. It wasn't effective. For example, if I wanted to share a tip on how to better unit test a piece of code, I could post on Yammer or I could write a wiki page, but few people would read it and even fewer would apply it, of course. So we decided to try out pull requests internally, just in the London office, to verify whether they would really slow us down. And it turned out they don't slow us down and they prove quite effective in sharing knowledge and raising code quality. So we pushed to have them across all offices and they're working really nicely. So yeah, all of our problems in the team were related to communication. In our case, I think it was mostly because we are in distributed offices, but I guess you would encounter similar problems if you have a big enough team, even if they're all in the same location. So for us, scaling our team means being able to execute on multiple projects across multiple locations while making sure that code quality improves and, and the knowledge is shared effectively. And for us, adopting the right tools helped a ton. And in our case, it was Yammer, obviously, and GitHub, but you have excellent alternatives with things like Slack, Campfire, or Fabricator. And also it's worth noting that none of this happened overnight. I mean. It's been three years working as a distributed team and we're still trying to get good at this. Okay, so that was the team. Now I'll, I'll go through our code base. We all know that big rewrites are almost never a good idea, but with a team distributed across three offices where each person is working on a different project, you just cannot do a big rewrite. It's not possible. For example, in our code base, we have three different base classes for views. We have component, which was the first attempt written in the early days of Yammer. Then we have component two, which tries to improve on the API of component and fix some of its issues. And then we realized we didn't want to maintain our own framework and we adopted Backbone. So we have like three layers and you have to keep those three layers in your head. And maintain them and make sure that all the new components play, ni play nicely together, which is not fun. We, we would love to rewrite all of the old components using backbone views, but it's just not possible. We cannot stop all other projects for this one thing because the cost is too big. Not to mention our final state would not be as good as we think it would be. We would probably create a similar mess to this guy. So. What we do is we come up with a plan of how to continuously improve something over time, and then we execute on it. 
sometimes we improve things as we work on project project work. So for example, if I'm working on an area of the code that still relies on component and component two, I will try to migrate it to backbone. But other times we will staff real engineering projects to ensure that the task is completely finished in a certain time window. And the downside to our approach is the cognitive load of having to maintain that legacy code for a long, long period of time. But at least for us, the alternative is much worse. Do I am conquer? Okay, I guess we've all heard something similar to this. The secret to building large apps is never build large apps. Break your applications into small pieces and then assemble those testable bite-sized pieces into your big application. And we kind of did that from the start, having components that do one thing, having one component per file, etc. But there were a few things that we didn't get right. First, we used namespaces hanging off a global variable. You can see the yam.views.foo thing. This makes it really hard to track down dependencies because people access that global namespace in all kinds of ways and it's hard to know where something is used. Second, our templates were inlined, which allowed people to use concatenation and all sorts of string manipulation, which leads to huge problems. Third, we would add the CSS to some random file, which would grow indefinitely. So in the same file, we would have the rules for 800 different components, and it was just impossible to, to maintain. And finally, the CSS had all sorts of specificity issues probably because of our reliance on type selectors, because we're using span and image and div in, in our selectors and that caused a lot of trouble. Also, our folder structure was all over the place. Components were deeply nested in random subfolders and it was impossible to find existing components. And then we had these horrible JSON files shown on the right that listed every file needed to create a certain bundle so, for example, you're seeing the YAM public bundle, which is composed of jQuery underscore component, component two, and 50 other files. And you would have to add these entries by hand and make sure that your dependencies are above your entry so that everything works nicely. And this was really cumbersome and made it really hard to know whether something was still in use or whether it could be deleted. So in 2013, we started converting JavaScript modules to AMD and using require.js to build our bundles. And in 2014, we started applying dependency management, not just to JavaScript, but also to CSS and HTML <coughs> templates. You can see that we are requiring the CSS for this particular component and also the HTML template, which we then use in the backbone view. And we also adopted CSS naming conventions to avoid specificity issues. So each meaningful element in that template has its own class selector. Also, we're moving to a folder structure where all components sit at the same level in the folder. And each folder contains just the JavaScript, CSS, HTML, and unit tests for that component. And we got rid of most of, the, of those JSON files that I showed before. Because once you start using dependency management, the tool does everything for you. You don't need to keep track of all those dependencies. So by applying this divide and conquer approach, things became easier to maintain because we're keeping logical related parts of a system together, which makes it much easier to understand and keep in your head. Things are also much easier to reuse because it's easier to see what's already there and create new components that are composed of smaller pieces. And things are also easier to replace, which is really important for us because we're experimenting all the time, which means constantly throwing away code. And replaceability is as important to us as reuse. So components enable this by keeping all the pieces together so that if we need to remove or replace a component, we just delete a folder. We don't have to hunt down selectors in a 2000 CSS file, 2000 line CSS file. And require.js is probably not the best tool for this, but we're using it for s historical reasons. If you are not using dependency management right now, I would look at something like Browserify or Webpack. 
because they're really good. I talked before about sharing knowledge through pull requests, but some pieces of knowledge are better shared by codifying them. That is by literally turning them into executable code. For example, we used to have a JavaScript style guide uh, that we asked people to follow, and we had a wiki page and everything, but most people didn't care enough to read it, and much less to memorize it and apply it. So what we ended up doing was choosing which rules we really cared about and turn them into a JS hint RC file and enforce, enforce those, those linting rules as part of our test suite. The same happened with our build process. We had a wiki page that described all the steps needed to build our frontend, but we've just replaced it with a single grant task that does it all for us. And we also tried to avoid long comments in the code and instead writing good unit and integration tests that exercise that logic. Because comments get stale really quickly, but tests that get executed every day, they do not. So yeah, sharing codified knowledge is as easy as doing a git push. So if I make a change, the moment I push, everybody on my team is up to date from the moment they pull. Okay, final slide. Takeaways. I don't want to end the talk leaving you with the impression that Yammer is doing everything right and if you're not doing all of these things, you're in trouble. But these are things that have worked for us and if you're in a similar situation to us, they may work for you. And in any case, I hope the talk fosters ideas in your team. So these are the points I covered. Learn to work as a distributed team, try different tools and processes and keep iterating to see what works for you. Improve things incrementally, because once you get past a certain size, you will not be able to move all of your team in lockstep. So big refactors will be out of the question. So learn to work incrementally as soon as possible. Find a way of dividing your large code base into smaller pieces. And for us, this meant developing self-contained components and making use heavy use of dependency management, which helped us tremendously. And finally, if a piece of knowledge can be turned into executable code, do it, because it's much easier to share and update. And that's it. Thank you very much.